Good evening and thank you for joining the RLS Foundation's webinar titled The Prevention and Treatment of um, Augmentation. My name is Carla Dzienkowski and I am the Executive Director of the RLS Foundation. I'd like to let everyone know on the webinar tonight that we are experiencing bad weather in Central Texas this evening, so please bear with us if the program is interrupted during the broadcast. Um, before we begin, please be aware that all attendees will remain on mute during this hour. We thank you for the questions submitted with your registration. Today's presenter, Dr. Mark Buckfuhrer, will answer as many questions as time allows following the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the webinar recording. The web webinar recording will also be made available in the members only section of our website. If you're not a foundation member and if you would like to view this and other recorded webinars, we invite you to become a member today by going to RLS.org. As always, individuals suspecting that they may have RLS should consult a qualified health care provider. Information offered in this webinar is for informational purposes and should not be considered a substitute for the advice of a health care provider. Dr. Mark Buckfuhrer is a consulting assistant professor at the Stanford School of Medicine. He sees patients and teaches sleep medicine doctors in training at the Stanford Sleep Medicine Center RLS Clinic, a member of the RLS Foundation's Quality Care Center Network. He's board certified in sleep medicine, pulmonary disease, and internal medicine. Dr. Buckfuhrer has written several books chapters and articles on RLS and has conducted research on the disease. He also sees RLS patients in his practice located in Downey, California and is a medical director of the lab. He is, was the editor of Nightwalkers for 13 years and has served on the foundation's medical advisory board for a total of 12 years. He is also a medical advisor for the Southern California RLS support group and attends and speaks at all meetings. Dr. Buckfer currently serves as a member of the Foundation's Opiate and Medical Bulletin Revision Committee. Dr. Buckfer, we thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I now invite you to begin your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Carla, and I'm looking forward to uh, going over the prevention and treatment of augmentation in the next hour. And by the end of this hour, I think everybody in the audience will be fairly expert on this problem. So the first question is, what is augmentation? Uh, people have heard the term. Uh, unfortunately, even many doctors don't know what augmentation is. It's very simply a worsening of restless legs after you get an initial improvement with a dopamine medication. And I've listed the current dopamine medications that are available. Uh, the first is levodopa, which was actually the first drug we found uh, augmentation. Uh, the brand name is Cinemet. Uh, then we got Tramipexol or Mirapex and Ropinirol, which is Requip, uh, to the short-acting dopamine agonist. Uh, then Rotigotine, which is the Nupro patch. And there's another drug called Cabergoline or Dostinex. Uh, we don't really use this much in this country because it's only approved for treating pituitary tumors uh, rather than uh, for treating uh, Parkinson's disease, which it's approved for in Europe, and therefore they can use it for restless legs, which they do there. However, this drug uh, has been associated with uh, fibrosis or scarring of heart valves, so it's not a drug I would like to use anyway. Now, one of the things uh, you can remember is uh, for augmentation, this is a worsening of RLS after an initial improvement with a dopamine medication, as I said before, but it can also occur with one other drug which is not a dopamine drug, and that's tramadol. The brand name is Ultram. This is a pain pill that is somewhat related to opioids. We're not even sure if it uh, binds to the opioid receptors, uh, but it's classed with that, uh, with the opioids, and if if it is a true opioid, it would be at the rock bottom as the weakest opioid. So when was augmentation first described? Richard Allen at Hopkins wrote a paper uh, in 1996, which was titled Augmentation of the Restless Leg Syndrome with Carbidopa Levodopa, 
which is Cinemet. Uh, by that point, most of us who were in the field knew about this augmentation process, but he's the one who gave the name to it. And he found it in 82% of his restless leg patients who were taking uh, Cinemet. And at that point, we were all warned not to use Cinemet on a daily basis. Uh, unfortunately, we still see lots of doctors doing that. He also found that uh, the problem was worse with higher doses, and we thought that perhaps patients can get by uh, with the lowest dose, which is the 25-100, uh, but even uh, that lowest dose with time typically will cause augmentation in almost all the patients. I can't say 100%, but most all the patients sooner or later get uh, some form of augmentation. And he found at that time that the augmentation process, the worsening due to the levodopa, was resolved by stopping or even decreasing the medication. Anyway, in 2003, they had a conference sponsored by the NIH to develop a criteria for diagnosing augmentation. Uh, then they said the same thing I've said before. This is a worsening of RLS symptoms after starting, and I shortened dopamine agonist uh, to DA, just for brevity here, with DA therapy, uh, which may occur within months or years. Uh, with the uh, Cinemet, which is a dopamine precursor or building block drug, it can sometimes occur even within weeks. But with the dopamine agonist like Requip and Mirapex, it often takes months, but sometimes even years. The first thing we notice, and this is what everyone should look for if you're worried about you yourself developing augmentation or someone that you know, is an earlier onset of the symptoms by at least two hours. So typically what happens, your restless legs before treatment would occur, let's say, at bedtime or an hour before bedtime. You start the medication, your RLS goes goes away, and then somewhere several months or, or longer, you start noticing that at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening when you're trying to relax, the RLS symptoms are occurring then, and they never occurred then before. So this earlier onset is one of our biggest clues that augmentation may be occurring. The second thing is an increase in the intensity of the symptoms. <clears throat> symptoms start, you know, before it may have been three, four, five out of ten in intensity, and all of a sudden there's seven, eight, or nine. Uh, it takes less time at rest or being sedentary for symptoms to come on. Uh, prior to this, maybe you could have been sitting for an hour or two hours and then uh, without symptoms at a certain time in the evening, and then you'll notice, my gosh, I can only sit for maybe an hour instead of two hours or an hour and a half, and as time goes on, this gets shorter and shorter unless you change the dose of the medication. And patients will often say, the medication effect doesn't last as long. I need more medication. The other thing we see, which is very characteristic, is a spread of symptoms to other body parts. Typically, they start, restless legs has to start in the legs, but it can then spread to the arms, and in fact, it can spread to every single body part. And with a severe symptom, uh, patients who have severe symptoms, I've seen it in virtually every single body part. The last thing is something called PLMW. Now, PLM are the periodic limb movements or the leg kicks that typically occur while patients are asleep. However, restless leg patients can also have these while awake. Uh, you may be watching TV, relaxing, and all of a sudden your leg will kick. And this can occur with or without any restless leg symptoms. So if these start happening for the first time or they start to worsen if you've had them before, that's another clue that augmentation may be occurring. Now a simplified version, and this is from the uh, augmentation paper, uh, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, what we said was, consider that augmentation may be present whenever a patient who has been on a stable treatment uh, for at least six months requests more medication. Uh, I even have a simpler version. If anyone is on a dopamine drug and the RLS worsens, it's augmentation until proven otherwise. And the otherwise is you have to rule out things like triggers, 
uh, patients may be put on an antidepressant drug or antihistamine or one of the many drugs that, that may worsen restless legs. So you have to go over all the meds and even many of the over-the-counter medications. Things like Benadryl uh, taken on a daily basis for allergies can worsen restless legs. So we have to check that out. The next thing is low iron levels and we check ferritin and iron levels. If those suddenly got low, uh, the patient uh, may be having uh, menstrual periods that are heavier and they lose iron or sometimes a gastric ulcer or other diseases uh, or just out of the blue and uh, if that's low, that can often uh, simulate everything about augmentation. And the third one is the most difficult one. This is just a natural worsening of restless legs which can occur over many years or decades. Uh, if the patient was worsening anyway and that happened to occur after you put them on a dopamine agonist, it could be confusing whether this is natural worsening or the augmentation problem. But uh, we'll go over uh, in a slide or so uh, some of the ways to differentiate, but that can be confusing. So here's the slide that helps us go through how to differentiate this from other conditions, and you'll see it can be tricky. Uh, we look at augmentation first, and uh, you can see where I'm pointing over here, that's the first column on the left. And what we see with the augmentation, uh, it, it is worse than before treatment, uh, and that means it usually occurs earlier and all the other things I talked about getting more intense. The earlier onset, the spread to the arms, um, they may have breakthrough at night just because symptoms are getting worse. And as you increase the dose, it gets worse. But here's the thing, it's not immediately. It could be worse uh, after uh, so sometimes weeks, but often months or even years. So that makes it very difficult. And as you'll see soon, it, it can confuse it with some, some of the other things that are similar. Uh, and then it improves when you decrease the dose. Uh, again, that often takes uh, only a few weeks, but it can take longer or it may not occur. So the next column uh, to the right is the end of the dose rebound. Now, what rebound is, is you give a medication that only lasts several hours. And for example, uh, if you're using Requip, it'll generally uh, last about six, seven hours. If you're using Mirapex, you might get seven or eight hours or possibly a little more. So a typical scenario is uh, someone starts out with the Mirapex or Equip close to bedtime. It takes care of the bedtime restless legs. However, they start uh, having more trouble, so they may take it a little earlier in the evening so that they can relax in the evening. But then when you go six, seven hours later, uh, which is the middle of the night, of course, the the medication is uh, no longer active, so they get rebound. So they get worse than before treatment, but it's in the early morning or middle of the night when the medication wears off. The earlier onset does occur, but only in the early morning. There's usually no spread to the arms. There is breakthrough at night, but again, only when the medication wears off. So you, if you know the duration of action of the medication, you can predict when there'll be trouble but it does not get worse when you increase the dose. In fact, it gets better because there's more medication on, bo on board. And if you decrease the dose, it never gets better because you need more medication. Now, the next column is tolerance. And we all know tolerance. Uh, this occurs with uh, many of the drugs like the benzodiazepines like Xanax or Ativan or sleeping pills that are in that class. Uh, it occurs also with opioids, uh, if you use it at high dose. The body kind of gets used to the medication and the receptors that the drug is acting upon kind of say, hey, I'm used to this drug, so I won't react the way I did uh, when I first got the drug. And with tolerance, you just need more medication to overcome this, although you might get further tolerance. So the uh, symptoms don't really get worse uh, there's not really an earlier onset and definitely no spread to the arms. There might be breakthrough at night because uh, the body just gets tolerant to the medication so it doesn't last as long. Uh, it does not get worse with an increased dose and it does not improve when you decrease the dose. 
uh, because it's just the medication isn't working as well, so you actually need more, which will make the, uh, the patient will do better. Now, natural progression is the next column over here, and this one is difficult uh, because, as you will see, um, it is definitely worse than before treatment because it's naturally gotten worse. You may have earlier onset, which occurs with natural progression, and you may have spread to the arms. You also may get breakthrough at night. Now, the two things we use to differentiate is that uh, things get worse as you increase the dose, but that may take a while. It may take months or even a few years. So many of the doctors will not keep thinking about that as they see what happens as they increase the dose. In fact, if it takes a few years, they'll just say, oh, you're getting more natural progression. And uh, typically, the improvement with the decreased dose doesn't always happen, and most of the doctors won't say, oh, well, I got to decrease the dose or get rid of the medication because they know the restless legs will go crazy. So this is a trap that many of the uh, specialists like neurologists and sleep specialists who actually see a lot of the restless leg patients, but if they're not as expert or understanding of augmentation or uh, really up on it, they'll often say, oh, the disease is just getting worse and we have to increase the medication. Uh, and that causes a lot of trouble, and I'll discuss that a little more later, but uh, this is the big problem that makes it very, very difficult uh, to see what's going on. But for those of us who understand augmentation, uh, we'll know right away that we shouldn't increase the dose, and typically if we decrease the dose or better yet stop the medication, we usually see in a few weeks, sometimes, sometimes a little longer, a significant improvement which usually proves that that's what they had. Now the last column is uh, the exacerbating factors. We talked a little before about that. Uh, and uh, sometimes, for example, you'll see uh, someone who's changed jobs. I had a patient like that recently who went from uh, being a job where he had to walk around all the time and a big plant and supervise everyone to a desk job and he said, my RLS is going crazy. And finally, we realized it wasn't augmentation or anything like that. It was simply he was sitting all day, and uh, that really provoked uh, the restless legs. But we look for low iron levels. We look for other drugs and things. And this can also simulate uh, most of the stuff with, restless, with, sorry, with augmentation. Uh, so you have to rule it out. And uh, I've, I've had cases where I sometimes thought the patient did have augmentation, and finally, they mentioned, oh, I'm taking this over-the-counter drug like Benadryl, but since my doctor didn't prescribe it, I didn't think about telling you about it. Okay, so what causes augmentation? What is going on here? And first, let me say, we don't really know, but I'm going to give you some of our best theories about what's going on. Uh, the first thing is called down-regulation of the dopamine receptor. And this is similar to tolerance. In fact, many of us think that tolerance may occur first before augmentation, and it's just the earlier process of going to augmentation. And what happens is you give the drug, the dopamine, and this is on a daily basis, the dopamine receptors say, hey, I'm used to seeing this drug every day, so I'm just not going to react as well because there's something a little funny here. It's not natural, and it starts down-regulating or just not reacting as strongly as it did before. Uh, so that's one of the theories, but with tolerance, you don't get a worsening of symptoms, you know, earlier onset and all these things. So why that, what happens after that is not really well understood. The second point is the imbalance of the dopamine receptor subtypes. There's actually five subtypes from D1 to D5. Most of the drugs we use hit the D2 and D3 subreceptors. Uh, and that creates an imbalance with the D1 and D4 and D5, and they start reacting a little funny, and that may be some of the cause of the uh, augmentation process is an overreaction by some of the other uh, non-stimulated uh, dopamine subtypes. The last point is something that uh, bothered me way back uh, 
with uh, the short-acting dopamine agonists, especially as we started using them a lot um, a after 1997 or so when uh, Requip and Mirapex became available and then when they got FDA approved in uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, you take a patient who uh, had mild, moderate, even severe RLS, uh, and you'd start them on the a dopamine agonist like Requip or Mirapex, and they'd say, wow, you know, my restless legs uh, are really doing great. And you see them two, three months later, there's no signs of augmentation or any other problems. They're tolerating the medication well. But here's something that patients used to ask me all the time. They said, am I addicted to this medication? Because now that I'm on it, I'm doing great. But if I forget a dose, my restless legs comes back two or three times more powerful and more intense than it did prior to ever taking this medication. So even within the first few months when things are going great, you can see there's a change in the dopamine system or restless leg uh, physiology of what's going on because now that you've given this dopamine agonist, uh, if you forget to take it, things don't just go back to square one as they do with the other medications that we give, things, uh, symptoms become much, much more intense. So there's some alteration of this whole dopamine system somewhere, somehow, that occurs very early. And, uh, you know, we can see there's a lot of potential for trouble down the line because it's, you know, the interactions we're causing are not without consequence. So how common is the augmentation process? Well, we saw that uh, with levodopa, just looking at patients, we didn't, uh, in that study, they didn't look how long it took, but 82% of patients developed augmentation. So clearly the majority, if you probably watch the patients long enough, that number probably would go up to 90, 95%. Well, with Mirapex or Pramipexol, uh, we know from a whole bunch of recent studies in the last five years or so that uh, the augmentation rate is seven to eight percent per year. So put very simply, by 10 years, almost 80 percent of patients put on Mirapex, Pramipexol, will end up with this augmentation process, usually severe enough to have to stop the medication. Now I don't have numbers for Equip. Uh, there's not been as many studies with that, uh, so I didn't want to put any numbers, but it's probably fairly comparable. Now, Nupro, uh, the Nupro patch or retigotine, we have studies with that, and we, we kind of know that the longer-acting medications, and Nupro is a 24-hour patch, of course, uh, the augmentation uh, problems seem to be significantly less. Uh, what we see is a 5% uh, augmentation rate after five years, or 1% per year, with the approved, the FDA approved doses of one to three milligrams. Now, one thing we know is that the augmentation is also related to the dose given. So, even in that study, that five year study, if you added the four milligram dose that they used, which is not FDA approved, the augmentation rate jumped up to 13%. And this is one of the reasons why we keep recommending uh, using as low doses as possible with the dopamine drugs. Now, uh, I just alluded to the fact that the augmentation is less common with the longer-acting dopamine agonists. But we have a little conundrum here. Uh, the way we recognize uh, the augmentation process, or the easiest and most common thing we see, is the earlier onset uh, by about uh, two hours. So if you're giving a drug that acts around the clock, uh, then you might be masking this augmentation rather than preventing it. So are we absolutely sure that the longer acting drugs are really uh, not causing as much augmentation or just masking it so we can't see it. Really not sure. But um, this is something that's still being studied. Uh, there was one good study uh, using long-acting Mirapex uh, 
in Europe that showed that uh, there was less augmentation problems. It was a year-long study on the average. But again, not long enough to really know whether we're just delaying our diagnosis or really causing less augmentation. Now again, how, as far as how common the augmentation process is, if you look at the national restless leg experts like me, and whenever we get together, we always kind of talk about this, uh, we feel now that over 75% of our referrals are due to augmentation, and that might even be higher. So clearly this is a big problem that we're seeing a lot of. So what are the recommended doses? And this is taken from the augmentation paper, which I'll introduce you to in a minute. Uh, for Pramipexol or Mirapex, start at the lowest dose, the 0.125 milligrams. And I can't tell you how often I see patients who are started on uh, much higher doses from the word go, and we never know whether they would have done better if they started with a lower dose and maybe been able to maintain a lower dose. Now for Pramipexol, the maximum recommended dose uh, on this paper is 0.75, and that's because the group of us who uh, created this paper uh, were an international group from Europe, uh, United States, and uh, even Japan. Uh, and the maximum recommended dose in Europe is 0.75. Here in uh, the US, the maximum recommended dose is 0.5. Now I'm going to tell you what my maximum dose recommended doses are in a later slide, but I wanted to uh, clue you in on where we are uh, for the usage of this medication. Will Pinerol or Equip start at the 0.25 milligrams? It's not as potent as Pramipexol, and the max recommended both here in Europe is 4 milligrams. For Retigotine or the Nupro patch, the initial dose is 1 milligram and the max is 3 milligrams, and that's the same everywhere. But be aware there are higher doses, up to 8 milligrams, available for Parkinson's disease. So what do most doctors and specialists uh, do when they treat augmentation or they see it? Typically what they do is they will increase the dose of the dopamine drug, and they will provide some temporary improvement which may last only weeks, but often last months or years. So even the fairly good specialists, the neurologists and sleep specialists, who know some stuff about restless legs and may have even heard about augmentation, all they see is the patient's complaining, getting worse, and if they give the patient a higher dose of the medication, just as they would do with Parkinson's disease, the patient gets better and maybe better for one, two, three, four years. And in their mind, when the patient gets worse again, this is natural worsening. And what do I see? Uh, the, and you saw the doses of Mirapex before. The maximum for Mirapex was 0.75 in Europe, 0.5 in the um, United States. They'll go up to 8 milligrams. That's 16 times the maximum recommended dose in this country. Uh, Ropinerol, uh, 4 milligrams is the max dose. And I've had patients whose neurologist has suggested they can go up to 24 and even 48 milligrams. And for Nupro, 3 milligrams is the highest dose approved. I have seen patients uh, 8 to 16 milligrams. And often, uh, it is combined with other dopamine agonists just to add insult to injury. They're getting so much dopamine agonists at the same time that uh, it eventually drives their restless legs crazy as the augmentation spirals. So as you give more dopamine agonists, you do get temporary relief, but you add fuel to the fire of this augmentation process. The other thing they do, sometimes they'll add what we call an alpha-2 delta drug. That's gabapentin, Horizon, which is a better delivery system for gabapentin, or Lyrica. Uh, this is actually not a bad thing to do because uh, at least they won't increase the uh, the dose of the dopamine agonist, so they won't add more fuel uh, to this uh, augmentation process. Uh, and that may work for a while, but sooner or later the augmentation process will get worse and the alpha-2 delta drug may not be uh, that helpful over time. So here is the task force article. Uh, and 
This article is available if you go to PubMed, and that's P-U-B-M-E-D, on an internet search, and put the title in or augmentation in, uh, you will find this paper there. And if you click on it, this is actually a free download. So you can access this without paying any money or being a, uh, a member of the journal or whatever. Uh, so you can get a copy of this. And I encourage everyone to get a copy, and you can read it uh, at length. It's uh, very interesting, and uh, it has lots of other recommendations. Uh, and I, I'm going to go over some of the key ones. The other thing you can do with this article, if you have a doctor who keeps wanting to increase your dopamine drug, and you know you have augmentation and there's, uh, you don't have any other access, you can give them a copy of this article, and hopefully they can follow the guidelines, which I'll show you, and be able to treat it. So when you're going over how to prevent augmentation in the first place, obviously if you don't use a dopamine drug in the first place, uh, then you can't cause augmentation, except for the use of tramadol, which uh, can occur. I've seen a few cases, but um, not quite as common. The other thing is, as first-line therapy, you can choose an alpha-2 delta drug. Uh, Horizon is approved for restless legs. Gabapentin isn't, but is uh, fairly inexpensive. Lyrica is the other drug uh, that is uh, approved. Uh, sorry, not approved, but uh, can be very helpful. Maybe a little expensive because it's brand name only. So, uh, the, one of the recommendations is use the alpha-2 delta as a first-line therapy, unless contraindicated or there's side effects or it doesn't work. Uh, again, these, these drugs are very good, but like anything, no drug helps every single patient. So if you have to use a dopamine drug, and sometimes due to expense or lack of effect of other drugs or lack of tolerance, uh, we have to use the dopamine drugs anyway. Here are the recommendations. First of all, use the lowest dose possible, but be aware that we all have seen augmentation even with the lowest dose. Uh, consider intermittent therapy. Uh, some patients uh, may be able to may, uh, use these drugs only three times per week. With intermittent therapy, you will not get augmentation. Uh, even Cinemet, which causes the most and quickest augmentation, I can give it to patients three days a week, sometimes even four, uh, and uh, you'll cause no trouble. The other thing with intermittent therapy, you could even give it longer if you keep alternating. And sometimes we'll do that uh, where we'll use it for a few weeks before the augmentation process has a chance to work, uh, and then we'll switch to another drug. So there's lots of different ways you can do this intermittent therapy. The other thing is do not increase the dose more than once. Very tempting to keep increasing it, and that's why I see those really massive Parkinson disease doses of uh, the dopamine drugs, which makes it uh, the augmentation pr process get worse and worse and much harder to treat the patient. The other thing we see, and I, I see this all the time, uh, patients on either Requip or Mirapex gets augmentation and the doctor changes to the other short-acting dopamine agonist. If you get it with one dopamine agonist, you're going to get it with another. Uh, and uh, one of the questions people always ask, well, if I have this augmentation and I go off the medication for a while, can I go back on? And the answer is, yes, you can go back on, but if you stay on it too long, the augmentation will definitely come back just as it does when you switch to another short-acting one. Uh, consider using the longer-acting dopamine agonist. The only one approved is Nupro, although there's others available. Uh, and that uh, does work sometimes. Uh, I have patients where uh, we can't uh, get a, a, an effective uh, uh, treatment from the other available drugs uh, and uh, or, or we're limited by the use of the other drugs and often using Nupro uh, if you're, for these patients may be very helpful. Uh, the other thing is keep the ferritin levels as high as possible. That's the iron. If the if the iron is low, augmentation is much tougher to treat, and sometimes just giving enough iron may reverse the process. So here I'm showing you the approved dopamine drug doses, and you can see the maximum 
again, is 0.75 in this country, 0.5 for Premapexol, for Rapinerol, 4 milligrams, and for Retigotine, 3 milligrams. Well, here are my maximum dopamine drug doses, and I've uh, published this in some papers and books. Again, let me just say that uh, not all the specialists agree with these lower doses, but I think that these are pretty reasonable doses to max out at. Uh, for Pramipexol, 0.25 milligrams, you can see that's considerably lower than the 0.5 or 0.75. For Ropinerol or Equip, one milligram instead of the four milligrams, and for the Nupropatra retigotine, three milligrams, which is actually unchanged from everyone else. And part of the reason for this is if you uh, act on the augmentation process at lower do well, first of all, at lower doses, you'll have less chance of getting augmentation, and when you do, it's much milder and much easier to handle. So this next slide is from that augmentation paper. And I know once you guys have had a few seconds to look at this, you will all be experts on treating augmentation. Now, only kidding, of course. I'm going to go over this and try to make it simplified. It'll only take a few minutes. So let's look at the top of this slide. The first thing is we want to eliminate exacerbating factors. Uh, we talked about the serum ferritin or iron levels. Uh, we, we want to get them above 50 to 75, the higher the better. Uh, lifestyle changes, uh, that's things like uh, patients being very sedentary, uh, even things like uh, drinking too much alcohol or other things uh, may worsen restless legs. And last is the exacerbating drugs, uh, over-the-counter drugs like Benadryl or prescription drugs like antidepressants. So then we classify augmentation as mild or severe. We look at the left side of the screen. Mild augmentation, the first thing is a temporal shift. That means it just occurs that two hours earlier we talked about. Uh, the dopam dopamine drug is below the maximum recommended doses. And I can tell you um, most of the patients I see are way, way, way above the maximum doses by the time they get to me. The symptoms only called, cause mild distress. They're not that... Uh, disturbing, people can live with them, and there's been no prior increase to the dose uh, above what was initially very effective. So if someone's on, let's say, um, Mirapex 0.25, and they were doing great, uh, they haven't already had an increase, because then you know they're in the middle of the augmentation process already. Severe augmentation is simply not mild. Everything I said there has already occurred and is gone or does not respond to the treatment, which will go on uh, from, from mild augmentation. So now let's go to this box over here. Uh, what do we do with mild augmentation? Well, we can keep the dopamine agonist dose the same, uh, and typically what we'll do is maybe give the dose a little earlier to take care of the earlier onset of symptoms, or you can take uh, the dose and split it. Let's say the patient's on Mirapex 0.25 milligrams. You give them 0.125 or half the dose earlier and half the dose later. If that fails, then you can increase the dose once. Now let me just say, at this point, I kind of advocate to my patients, and this is my own personal viewpoint, that I have to say is not shared with all the other experts, but it is shared with some of them. At this point, I know the writing is on the wall. If I, keep it, if I increase the dose, I will make them better for a while, but sooner or later, they are going to have trouble and have to bite the bullet and do something else. And whatever else I do is going to be harder every time I increase the dose. So it, when I see a patient uh, with mild augmentation, I'll often uh, try to push them or, shall we say, direct them to bite the bullet at this point rather than kick it down the road when it may be harder to treat. So if this strategy fails, uh, a complete switch is recommended. And you can either switch to an alpha-delta uh, ligand. These are the alpha-2 delta drugs like gabapentin, horizon, and Lyrica. Uh, and the, the trouble with this is the higher the dose of the dopamine agonist and the longer the augmentation has occurred, the less chance that drug will have of uh, 
being strong enough or, to uh, relieve the restless leg symptoms that are occurring. Or you can change them to rotigotine or a long-acting dopamine agonist at uh, you know, no, no more than approved doses. This is actually a much simpler thing to do because you're replacing a dopamine agonist with another one. And if the doses are correct, if you match them nicely, uh, there usually is a very smooth transition. So not an unreasonable thing to do, uh, although, again, we're not 100% sure that this is not just masking the restless leg augmentation process or preventing it or treating it. So if these strategies don't work, then we go on to severe augmentation because uh, it hasn't responded to these treatments. And really, uh, what we want to do is reduce, uh, at least reduce the Dope, short-acting dopamine agonists or whatever dopamine agonists they happen to be on, but uh, really the best way to do this is get rid of the dopamine agonist completely at this point. Uh, and what you see, what's very interesting is usually about 10 days on average, but it could be a little shorter, it could be even a lot longer. After you get rid of the dopamine agonist, the augmentation process reverses and the restless legs becomes a lot easier to treat. However, the issue you have is for those 10 days plus or minus, uh, the, uh, the restless legs may go completely berserk. So we have a few plans for this. Uh, the first one is called cross titration. As you lower the dose of the dopamine agonist, you add the alpha-2 delta drug like gabapentin or Horizon or Lyrica, and you slowly increase that drug while you're decreasing the dopamine agonist drug. The trouble is the alpha-2 delta drugs work really, really well uh, when given to a new patient without any augmentation issues. However, when you're having augmentation and you take off the dopamine agonist drug even slowly, the restless legs just go berserk and often they overwhelm the ability of the alpha-2 delta drugs in this situation to take care of symptoms and most patients just have trouble tolerating that. The second one is a, again the switch from a short acting to a long acting. Uh, the trouble with this is often by the time you see these severe patients they are already on such high doses of the dopamine agonist drugs that the switch cannot be made to a reasonable dose of retigotine or approved dose of the Nupro patch or other long-acting dopamine agonists. Uh, sometimes that, that works if you can get them at the right stage and that's why, again, I emphasize the earlier the better because it gives you more options such as this option which you might not have if you wait too long. Uh, the third and last option here is the 10-day washout. And that's done by Hopkins, John, the guys at John Hopkins, Richard Allen, and uh, Chris Early. Uh, the advantage of that is at the end of 10 days, patients are usually starting to improve and might be fairly good. And then you might have to give them less medication because their RLS isn't as bad. And uh, at that point, an alpha-2 delta drug or even an opioid may work very well. Sometimes they don't even need any medication. However, it is very difficult for most patients to survive the 10-day washout because they may not get any sleep at all for those 10 days. And sometimes it could be a little less, sometimes it can be significantly longer. So if these strategies fail uh, and the patient has really bad restless legs uh, when you're trying to get them off the uh, medication, uh, that's when we consider an opioid. And I can tell you this, typically ends up being very successful therapy as long as the patient doesn't have any problem with tolerance of the opioids or of course a history of opioid abuse or drug abuse in the past. And uh, that's what I end up doing for a very high percentage of cases. Uh, the other thing we can consider is uh, giving the patients intravenous iron which brings their iron levels up very high and uh, may also sometimes short-circuit this whole uh, augmentation process. So we've come to the end of the talk. Uh, I hope you've learned quite a bit, but now we're ready for the questions and answer time.
Okay, we'll start with the first question. I use the new new pro patch. If augmentation does occur, is there a possibility the patch could be effective again in the future? Okay. And this is a good question and it's reasonable uh, and I, I will expand it uh, for even Requip and Mirapex or any dopamine drug that's used. Once you get augmentation, you will probably get augmentation again when you reintroduce the medication as I stated before. But let me give you the exception. Uh, if I see a patient who developed augmentation uh, with three milligrams of Nupro, four, five, uh, four, six, eight, you know, some of the higher doses. What I may do in the future, when I, especially if I'm stuck, uh, I may add other medications. Uh, the patient may be on an opioid, such as oxycodone or methadone, for example. Maybe low dose, maybe they can't tolerate it that well, so I can't go as high as I'd like. Maybe I'll also add uh, a medication like Horizon, Gabapentin, or Lyrica. But if I don't get full control, I will sometimes add a very low dose, like maybe the one or two milligrams of the Nupro, uh, even though they've had augmentation before. And sometimes by keeping that dose really low, I may get away with it. But I can tell you from experience, sometimes I don't. So I do it with caution, but I only do it when there are not uh, great, better alternatives. Okay. Um, I am on Ropinarol and Augmented. Do you recommend a fast or a slow reduction of the dosage? Must you go off the drug completely? Okay. Uh, people who augment, as I said earlier uh, in the talk, may benefit from just a reduction, but from our experience, the best result is if you can get them completely off the medication. And the question is, should you get them, uh, should you taper off of it slowly or should you just cold turkey it and that depends on a couple of factors uh, the first is the dose if you're on a very high dose uh, sometimes tapering is a lot better if you're on a low to medium dose often that can be uh, taken off uh, just cold turkey but as I said before the RLS will get a lot worse so you want to make sure you can replace it with something that is effective to treat the symptoms and often uh, only the opioids will be up to that situation. Okay. All right. Um, can Cinemet or Rimastigmine taken simultaneously exacerbate augmentation? I also have Parkinson's disease. Okay, this is a very interesting question in that uh, Cinemet uh, typically uh, causes augmentation in 90-95% of restless leg patients. Uh, but there is an exception and for some reason, which I'll expand in a second, it doesn't seem to cause augmentation as much or sometimes hardly at all in the Parkinson patients. But here's the difference. Uh, restless leg patients actually have quite a bit of dopamine in their brains. We've actually looked at uh, 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 brains that have been donated uh, with restless leg patients and there's lots of dopamine there. However, uh, if you look at the brains of Parkinson patients, they have no dopamine. So there's a, a big difference there and the patients I've seen, and I have quite a few of these, uh, who are being given Cinemet for their Parkinson symptoms just don't seem to develop that uh, augmentation problem. So I wouldn't worry about any of the uh, doses or uh, even combinations of Mirapex and uh, Cinemet in uh, a Parkinson patient who also has restless legs. Okay. How do you get off dopamine agonists after being on them for years? I simply cannot do it no matter what I do. Okay. And uh, this is what I alluded to before that even after a few months of therapy, even before any augmentation has occurred, it's really tough to stop those dopamine agonists and patients often feel addicted to these drugs and it may even be very similar to a true addiction in many respects of the term. Uh, but with augmentation this is even worse and the really for patients like that that have tried and maybe tried some other drugs like gabapentin or Horizon, 
possibly the only way to get off is with the addition of an opioid like oxycodone or methadone. And if done by someone who knows what they're doing and can guide you through it, this often can be a very painless process. Okay. How long does it usually take to um, to um, switch over to an opioid without any um, augment any more symptoms of the RLS going on? You know, uh, it often uh, it, it can occur within the first day. Uh, you know, usually I advise my patients. Um, I try to tell them to take the least amount that I think will help, but I may have them take a shade more for the first few days and then start to ratchet back once they see how it works. Uh, sometimes it takes, uh, you know, one three to three or four days to, for them to find the right dose. But once they find that dose uh, of the um, opioid to cover the symptoms, it's usually pretty, uh, you know, pretty, pretty effective, and they don't have any more trouble. And many patients within the first day or two are saying, "Hey, the transition was no big deal." That's good to hear. Okay, we'll go on to next question. My antidepressant increase has led to augmentation of my restless legs. Any suggestions? Okay, here's here's a very, very common problem. Uh, first of all, patients who have restless legs, especially when they haven't been treated well, will get very depressed over their situation and very anxious uh, because they know they're going to get restless legs every night. That's going to cause severe insomnia. So they're often put on antidepressants, which of course make restless legs worse. Those patients, I know I can get off the antidepressants if they started needing them uh, after the RLS symptoms got bad. But I have a whole bunch of patients, they've been on antidepressants for years, and stopping them is a real issue because they will then get severe depression, plus or minus anxiety, and I never want to mess with that. So when that's the case, uh, you have a couple of choices. You can change to uh, one of the few antidepressants that doesn't worsen restless legs, which is Welbutrin. Uh, maybe Trazodone um, it doesn't bother restless legs, but it's not that helpful. And we sometimes use an older drug called Disipramine, but it has some side effects and may not be as effective. But for the most part, if my patient had severe depression before restless legs and uh, it needs the medication, I will just treat around it. And the majority of the time, I can figure out a way uh, to add additional medication so that they can take their antidepressant, which they need, and still control their RLS symptoms really well. Okay. Thanks. Um, in treatment of patients who also have bipolar disorder, have there been any, has there been any evidence of escalating mania with augmentation? You know, that's a very hard question to answer because you would have to look at the psychiatric literature. And the trouble is most of the psychiatrists would not really know what augmentation is, and there's certainly been no study. So we don't have any data on that. But just like any stress can worsen uh, bipolar, especially mania, one can imagine uh, it would not take too much of severe augmentation and uncontrolled restless legs to drive a bipolar patient into um, the uh, manic phase. Furthermore, insomnia kind of goes along with the manic phase and with bad restless legs you have more insomnia and the less you sleep and the less good sleep you get, the more every, virtually every psychiatric disease is worsened by that. Okay. Are there any natural remedies for RLS? This is a two-part question. If not, is dopaminergic-induced augmentation safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding? Okay. Let me handle the second part first. Uh, the thing about breastfeed, breastfeeding and pregnancy is dopamine drugs are not uh, okay for pregnancy because uh, they're category C, uh, which means they present too high a risk to developing fetus. The other issue for breastfeeding, uh, we do not recommend dopamine agonist drugs because they block something called prolactin, which is what helps women secrete milk. So if you give the dopamine agonist drug uh, to a breastfeeding woman, she will not be able to breastfeed. So that part's easy. Uh, 
uh, what, the, what was the first part of the question again? Are there any natural remedies for RLS? You know, there's not a lot of natural remedies. Uh, I mean, one can think the replacement of iron may be somewhat natural, and if you're low on iron, that certainly can help. Uh, there's also, um, well, some patients believe that, you know, uh, gluten or uh, high natural or, or high, um, uh, you, know, sugar, uh, you know, refined sugars and things like that may bug restless legs, but we're really not sure about that. But there are some um, some treatments. Uh, there's this uh, foot wrap called Restific, which is recently available. I don't have too much experience with that, so I can't comment. And there's also um, uh, a vibration pad, uh, Relaxus, that's been approved. That's been approved, FDA approved, and may be helpful for some restless leg patients. Or you can use the pneumatic compression um, devices, which is like yeah. an alternating pressure. But if anyone has, there's a consensus paper um, written by uh, Dr. Jennifer Hensley, who's on our SMAB, um, that we can um, give you a link to. It's also on PubMed, and um, that's available. And we also have a handout. So if you're, um, we, if you need information for pregnancy and breastfeeding, we we are able to help you. So just contact the foundation. Um, you can contact me, Carla, at rls.org, and I'll get you the information that you need. Let me see. Um, have you seen many cases of augmentation on Nupro? I augmented on it just after a year, but had a 14-year history on other dopamine agonists. You know, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen as much augmentation on the Nupro, and again, possibly because uh, there's less augmentation or like any long-acting drug, it may be masking it, but I certainly have seen, uh, you know, enough cases, uh, but not anything close to the amount that I've seen with the shorter-acting drugs, Mirapex and Requip. Okay. Um, is it possible to start on another RLS medication while titrating down from clonopin, um, which uh, may have caused me to have aug augmentation? Okay. First, let me say clonopin is actually not really a restless leg drug and it doesn't really cause augmentation since it's not a dopamine drug or the tramadol. What clonopin is, it's related to Valium, Ativan, uh, Xanax, it's a benzodiazepine drug and the way it really works, it doesn't really calm down restless legs, it just puts you to sleep. Uh, but people develop tolerances drugs so after a while it'll seem like the restless legs is getting worse because it won't put you to sleep and you'll have more restless legs in the evening uh, or sleep time, but that's only because you develop tolerance to the drug. So m my advice is uh, clonopin, is it, well first of all, clonopin is one of my least favorite drugs. Uh, if you need a drug to get to sleep, there are much, much shorter acting drugs than clonopin and it's not really a restless leg drug, so uh, anyone who's on that drug having problems like tolerance or it's not working as well should probably consider having that drug tapered off and then treating the restless legs with true restless leg drugs um, such as uh, you know the dopamine drugs or the alpha 2 delta drugs etc uh, but realize that it's very tough to get off clonopin it, it creates a very strong dependence on it and uh, the patient may have trouble with uh, getting to sleep for quite a while until they get off the drug and are off it for a while. Okay. Um, is there, um, what is the best opiate when augmentation has occurred? Okay. You know, that's a very individual thing, but I can tell you from my experience that I prefer starting with methadone if all things are equal. I would say with methadone, 70% of my patients uh, have fewer side effects and more effective treatment. However, 30% of my patients will like any of the other opioids, and usually my second one is oxycodone, but uh, when I have trouble, and especially because I see the more difficult patients, I sometimes go through three, four, five, six, or even seven opioids until I find the right one uh, for any individual. Uh, these are, the, of course, a few of the tougher cases. Most patients will do well with, you know, they probably could do fairly well with most opioids, but again, 70% of my patients seem to prefer the methadone. Okay. 
Um, is there any current research or information about DAWs? Now, DAWs is something called dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome. Uh, m almost all the literature on DAWs or withdrawing from you know things like Mirapex or Equip, uh, especially too quickly, where you get uh, things like anxiety, depression, other weird symptoms. These are virtually all reported in the Parkinson's disease group, uh, which again Parkinson's is quite a bit different since they have no dopamine and um, uh, you know uh, they're not like the restless leg patients. I have actually seen a few of my restless leg patients who thought they had DAWs. I can't be sure whether they had it or not. Uh, it it what makes it so difficult is when you get off a dopamine drug, especially if you're not given something to take care of all the restless leg symptoms, you may easily have a lot of anxiety, depression, and other things that we see with this dopamine agonist withdrawal symptom. So. Uh, First, I'll say that it's probably not as common in restless leg patients, and actually when it occurs, it occurs much, much more often in patients who develop impulse control disorders with the uh, dopamine drugs. So that usually occurs first and then this does, but uh, I don't think we're going to see really too many true cases of it in our restless leg population. Okay. Um, Quick question. Uh, this will be our last question. I know we're running over. And um, question that this came in um, later today with a registration is: Can medical marijuana be used to treat augmentation? You know, uh, I think medical marijuana uh, can be tr used to treat mild to moderate symptoms um, that occur just around bedtime. Uh, the medical marijuana is actually fairly. Uh, effective. Uh, only a few puffs or inhalations of a vaporized form of uh, marijuana, not the edible type, let me add, uh, can work very quickly, often within five minutes or less, but it only lasts an hour or two. So it's pretty good for patients who say, I only get restless legs at bedtime, but if I get to sleep, I'll be good for the rest of the night. Uh, might be quite good for that situation, but for people with augmentation who have symptoms all along, uh, it wouldn't be good definitely by itself as an adjunct or additional treatment, possibly, but again, since I'm also a lung specialist, I'm not too eager for my patients to put anything in their lungs that doesn't belong there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um... All right. Well, I just wanted to, Dr. Buckfear, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to share your experience and expertise um, in caring for patients with RLS augmentation. I'm sure that your pre presentation provided answers to questions for so many on tonight's webinar. I'd like to invite everyone to join us for our next webinar on Friday, February 10th at 2 p.m. Central to discuss neurostimulation presented by uh, Dr. Winkleman. I thank everyone for joining us and have a wonderful evening.